Hello. My name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. Or some people think that I'm the real Forrest Gump because his, his was not real, mine, mine were real. In 1974, Upton Bell had just left as general manager of the New England Patriots when he was approached by Bob Schmertz, who owned the New York Stars of the new but financially strapped World Football League. Schmertz knew that Upton Bell knew the right people who could save his football franchise, already awash in a sea of red ink. For 13 years, Upton Bell's father was NFL Commissioner Burt Bell, a sports legend in his own right. And if anyone could write this ship in New York, it was Upton Bell. I said, okay, let's set up a meeting. I had a meeting with Celta, with, with Smurts and then kind of tentatively agreed to, to take the team over, but I wasn't going to keep it in New York. The reason is years earlier, I and my scouting trips had gone through Charlotte, North Carolina and took a look at it and I said, you know what, this is a very fertile area. Someday the NFL is going to come in here. I said that 30 years before it happened. So with that said, I called Babe Perilli, who was the coach there, former Patriots player, New York Jets backup to name it. I said, meet me tomorrow, we're going to a press conference and we're getting on a plane and going to Charlotte and announce it. And I thought, Are you, yeah, I, I can just imagine somebody said that to you. The next day, I couldn't believe it. Like a hundred press showed up for a team that nobody gave a damn about. But in New York, as you know, everything is big. So in the back of the room is Howard Cosell. Hello again, everyone. It's good to have you with us for this event. Well, Upton Bell, you've done it again. How dare you do something like this? I said to him, Howard, nobody gave a damn about this club. They played out in Randall's Island. It's New York. You don't leave New York. <laughs> to go to some swamp someplace else. <laughs> but that swamp was rife with potential investors like Arnold Palmer, one of the greatest and charismatic players in sports history. We had a terrific meeting and he said, I'm gonna give you a gold Cadillac. Uh, he said, and it'll be, you know, I'll all advertise Arnold Palmer Cadillac. And he said, I, I will agree eventually to at least putting, at that time, $5,000 into it. With one of Bell's chief investors aboard, media mogul Ted Turner then promised widespread coverage on his fledgling television network. He was talking about what he could do with my team. And he said, I can take you and put you all over the South. And he said, we can take on the NFL. He said, we can, we can do all of that. The newly named Charlotte Hornets were born, but crushing outstanding debt lingered in New York City. Smarts in New York owned a, uh, owed a huge cleaning bill to this company uh, worth like $30,000 or more, and they had sent a court order and a representative down to Shreveport to take the uniforms away. Now, this is the guy I'm supposedly going to be a partner with that I've got to pay off, and, and he can't pay his bill in New York or refuse to do it. So I said, look, as soon as the game's ended, is there a back way out? <laughs> I said, get those uniforms on the bus and get them the hell out of there. So essentially, they tried to do that, except they were surrounded like Butch and Sundance. There was no way they take the uniforms. We were the only team that was in second place, one of the top teams in the league, and, and uh, were out of the playoffs because we, we couldn't afford to go t t to all the different sites and we had to get the uniforms back. Never happened then, will never happen again. Imagine trying to explain that to the media. And the way I explained it is I said, you know, uh, the league's certainly having problems and uh, we would prefer to, you, you can imagine, you know, I went into the Nixon playbook or one of them and, <laughs> you know. Putting the best face forward. That's yeah, all that, that's all we can do. Nope. So, so we're voted out of the playoffs by the league executive committee because of the uniforms and the ability to pay to get to the sites down the line. The uniformless Hornets were not the only WFL team 
losing their shirts. So we get a call in my lawyer's office, and it's a judge live from court. He said, I'm judge so-and-so, and -and he said, uh, this Florida Blazer team, he said, uh, doesn't have enough money, and he said, they owe all sorts of money. And he said, I got all sorts of creditors, and they're here in court. And he said, uh, the only way, Mr. Bell, they can make their game up to play you, now the game sold out, he said, is for you to pay their way up and pay their paychecks. You had to pay, you had to pay money for the opponent? Uh, for the opponent. <laughs> so I called back and I said, okay. I said, we'll do it. So here we go. I booked the flight for my opponent to fly to Charlotte, agreed to pay, yeah, maybe it was $1,000 on a player, and basically they beat us. <laughs> so I got the trifecta. <laughs> pay their way up, pay the paycheck, and lose the game. Another story, Tales from the Crypt. I got this call. Hi, this is Paul. Sasso, he said, I'm in Memphis. I think I've got the answer. I've got a model of, a, of an underground stadium because it's so hot in Charlotte, and I think I can get the money, put the money up to help you save your team. So this guy flies to Charlotte. I meet, meet with him, and uh, now the story is beginning to come out. His real name is Paul Sasson. He somehow stole the plane, a jet plane, private plane in Memphis, flew up to see America's greatest sucker, yours truly, uh, that he is actually in the witness protection program, that he's actually from New York and uh, was worried about you know the mafia, whatever he knew about it, he was gonna be killed and uh, was eventually tried to commit suicide off the Veranzano Bridge and talked off by the one and only still around today, Geraldo Rivera. What a scene, huh? This is my new investor. (laughs) And years later, we find out that he is found in the trunk of a car and uh, people can't tell whether he either committed suicide or, or the mafia finally got him. Suspicion also surrounded Hornet star receiver George Sauer Jr., primarily regarding the infamous 1974 kidnapping of Patty Hearst, granddaughter of newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. It was a kidnapping case that stunned the world. Uh, This person, I think it was the FBI, said, um, we want to find out if Mr. Sauer is hiding Patty Hearst. (laughs) I'm going, everything else is happening. Why not this too? Why would they think he'd be hiding Patty Hearst? Well, I mean, what, what? well, because he was in he he in some ways uh, I won't say was involved, but but George Sauer was one of those people that was kind of counterculture, but in a very quiet way. By 1975, the WFL was drowning in debt. Something needed to be done and fast. An idea was hatched to lure aging NFL superstar quarterback Joe Namath of the New York Jets into the league to restore fiscal sanity. 1975, Namath was at the end, but we figured a name like this is something that that really will grab the public and help save the league. We were gonna put him in Chicago, right in the middle of of the country, uh, instead of New York, because at the time there's still no team in New York. And the whole deal was, too, which nobody knew, and I've never told it till this day, is that basically uh, the agreement was among all of us that he'd never be tackled. <laughs> that you rush the passer, and you could fake it like wrestling, like, you know, like Vince McMahon. Oh, my God, a grandma just missed him. That you would make the move, and then you would basically run by him, or, or the tackle would move you out and you run by him because of the knees and, and you didn't want to lose your major attraction. They, we came this close to having him do it. 
but Namath remained with the Jets, crippling the WFL and resulting in the loss of the league's television deal, which rendered the WFL invisible. The end for Upton Bell would take place in October 1975 on the rain-soaked turf of Philadelphia's Franklin Field, where 16 years before, Upton's father, NFL Commissioner Burt Bell, collapsed and died watching an Eagles-Steelers game. It was an eerie homecoming. So we're playing the Philadelphia Bell there. My mother, who hadn't gone to a game uh, before my father died, years, I talked her into coming to the game. Typical of my luck, it's pouring rain, uh, there is a strike on, the stadium is surrounded by unions that don't want to let anybody in but the players. And we play the game with not one person in attendance in a driving rain where you could hear on the artificial turf nothing but the squish, squish, squish of, of the cleats or of the shoes. Everybody in the press box, uh, we lose the game. Everybody goes back in the plane. My mother goes home. She's dead within a month, has a heart attack. And that Monday, uh, the league is shut down. And all I can think of is, my father died there and so did my team. The full circle, two deaths. One of a father, one of a son's team. Shakespearean, the ending. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So what do I take out of it? It's a great experience. I, I'm not bitter about it, nothing. I loved every down and up minute of it. It's life. You've got to live it. No regrets. In the first half. Sherman's going to go to the air. It's going to work. Not quite to George Sauer. And so it'll stay tied. Watch George Sauer here. Wide open on the play. The ball just a little bit high.